Welcome to PDMA Corporation, home of the MCE Max. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. Once again, my name is Todd Gunderson, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. And as always, we are welcomed by our Vice President of, Se of Product Development, Mr. Noah Bethel. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. And as always, we truly appreciate our customer base as they constantly provide us with tremendous amount of data. And in this case, uh, pressure. What does that mean? <laughs> different things to different people. Different right? things to different uh, people. But when it, comes to, when it comes to motors and applications, that's always bad. Oh, yes. Right? Pressure is never a good thing. <laughs> never good. And so in this case here, we're going to talk about what happens to the process uh, when an ID fan goes down. Okay. So an induced fan goes down. So here's our nameplate information. Uh, we have a Westinghouse 50 hertz, 3.3 kV uh, voltage, 204 full load amps. So we're talking about a pretty large motor here. Very decent sized motor and coming to us from uh, internationally, which is always interesting. Right. So, and, and you bring up a great point. This is from Indonesia, a cement uh, factory uh, in Indonesia that uh, provided us this data. So it's 1,250 horsepower or 932 kilowatts. A uh, six pole motor, 994 RPM. So it's fairly slow rolling motor. Relative. It is, yes. Yes, and then uh, based on the case study that, that you had mentioned, uh, I, I, it's interesting that a lower RPM motor is, you know, is, is, is suspicious of having broken rotor parts. And we said it's an ID fan, it's an induced fan, so it's designed to suck the, provide air outlet uh, of the system. So if pressure builds up too much, you could possibly have an explosion. Yeah, I saw that, uh, that reference to explosion on the notes, and I'm thinking, well, explosion's another word that doesn't... Not generally a good word uh, around an industrial environment. No, those are never end up well. So here's a picture of the motor, and uh, we can see it's a fairly large size, uh, physically large. And uh, we're also on the left-hand side of this. We're seeing where they're hooking up uh, with the MC Emacs, our Emacs test leads, and they're getting current samples. Now, we could also have MTAPs installed here, so you don't have to do this type of testing where you hook up to the Tesla or where you hook up to the uh, live lead connections. Absolutely, yeah. This is not the most friendly uh, uh, cabinet to get into, like any of them. And uh, a lot of bolts are designed to hold that on. It is clean. It's a clean environment as far as, you know, the maintenance that they're performing on the switch gear looks good. Cables look uh, really, really well ma managed. And, uh, but still, if you don't have to take that door off, it'd be a good thing. Right. So when this motor goes down or if it goes down during production, everything stops because you need this fan in place or else the furnace shuts down. Right. So it's very important. So we... Essentially, we went out, we did a one-time test because we heard some noise and there was some heat, so it prompted the technician to go out and do a test and lo and behold, what do we see? Uh, pull pass I-band on our first test. Yeah, and that's, uh, and, 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 and you know, you look, it's above the caution line. This is an, a relatively elevated pull pass frequency and uh, you hate to see that on the first test. Especially with a motor that was recently installed, probably what, two, they said February of 2014, so uh, relatively less than a year maybe in service. Yeah, that's short term. And ideally, this would be more of a second or third test in that situation. Ideally, it would be. So let's do some further evaluation. We go out to our fifth harmonic. Now, what does this tell us? The fifth harmonic is a second test to, to help us solidify whether the pull pass frequency seen in the previous graph is coming from more likely a mechanical or a load-based uh, anomaly or whether it actually is coming from a magnetically induced anomaly from the rotor. It's a, uh, it's a it's it's been a great test for us. It's one of the how many methods that we offer for rotary evaluation. For those of you that get tip of the week, it's uh, we talk about this this swirl effect as we call it, and uh, certainly it is it is indicative of a of a phase shift in the in the rotor flux uh, on or around a broken or cracked bar. Now in this case here, you see since it's 50 hertz system, it's at 250, that's the fifth harmonic. If it were a 60 hertz system, it would be pushed out a little further at the 300 hertz. We would expect to see those three peaks if we had issues with our rotor bars. Correct. So next, we do our DMOD. And in the DMOD test, we can see a pretty highly elevated 
whole pass sideband as well. Right. We strip out all the, you know, the basic fundamental frequency information, which allows us to look more more isolated at the pull pass frequency. And it's, it surely sticks out. You know, we have this sort of, you know, uh, minimum acceptable value uh, uh, of about 0.3. And if it gets up above that, we start to raise the flag of concern in this situation. Uh, a caution pull pass in the, in the, in the initial graph. Uh, is, is indicative of a, of a problem, and now we can confirm it with, with the third indicator, which is the demodded spectrum uh, above 0.3. And now what's also interesting, in the notes, the technician noted that he was hearing sound at about 0.58 hertz, which when we look at our uh, FFT and our demodulation spectrum, that's where this peak exists at, right around 0.58. And that's good correlation, right? And not always do you get that kind of good correlation. Vibration uh, readings will a lot of times be intermittent for a rotor anomaly. Uh, and when you see it, you want to try to get the current spectrum involved and see if you can correlate those. So in this situation, it was a great correlation, both at the same frequency. Vibration elevated at 0.58 hertz. Current spectrums uh, elevated at 0.58 hertz. It's, it's kind of a, a great marriage of information. And then... Lastly, we can look at our go-to test, uh, which really is a nice uh, look at our inrush startup. You don't just need it for inrush. You can use it for process analysis, and you can see some pretty substantial current swings here. Yeah, we really like the envelope current for, like, like, like you said, Todd, process analysis, load you know, analysis. Uh, and in this situation, when you're talking about a fan, Right? You wouldn't expect a lot of variation unless the load is driving it. So you do have to know the load a little bit. But in this situation, we're looking at about what appears to be 10% of full load uh, amperage swings, and that's just not something you'd expect from an ID fan. So let's look at the cult. We pull it apart, and wow, we see something pretty substantial. Almost to the point where you wonder if, since it's just the one crack here, pretty significant crack, yeah, I'm thinking like you. This is, you know, motor's been installed less than a year probably. This is unfortunately the first test we took. It's hard for me to look at that crack and think that it hasn't been around for a while. And then, of course, you see the burning lamination tips at the open slot, and all that leads to a, a big concern that, that this has been running like this for a while. And it runs along the whole bar, and we're essentially current is flowing where on this now, Noah, because the bar is broken. Right. By design, the current without the bar broken would flow right down that 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 bar. But instead, when you don't have the bar to conduct from the end ring, the flux that is creating the torque around this motor, it's going to complete a path one way or the other. So it starts to try to send current actually down the tips of the laminations, and they're just not designed to handle that. So it starts to burn the tips of those insulation and the lam laminations up and as a result opens the slot a little bit more for the unfortunate possible future of the bar coming out of the slot. Yeah. Now, what's interesting, and we always talk about this, when you have a rotor problem, yes, of course it has to be fixed, but there are some things that you can do to prolong that fix and satisfy the needs of production. Right, and, and, and if you're looking at, at shutting down for uh, you know a, a big loss versus running a motor with a, a defect, Obviously, you've got to make a hard decision, uh, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot of things you can do to, to minimize the stress on that rotor, to prolong the life, and to, and, and to, and to continue to, product, you know, to produce uh, you know, a product. Um, the first one, minimize stopping and starting. The most stressful time of a motor's you know, running operation is when you start it. Okay? Variable frequency drives help that a little bit. In this situation, we're not dealing with that. It's across the line, so a lot of currents flowing. Uh, through the bars and unfortunately across those laminations during starting and stopping. So that's a real big, a big issue. Uh, minimizing load fluctuations. Uh, this is a lot of times up to an operational uh, requirement. If the operations can steady state this, knowing that there's a rotor defect, it's going to uh, reduce the amount of, of, of fluctuating currents, which are going to an increase and decrease of slip on the motor, which is, of course, going to cause more current to flow down the broken bar. Um, increasing the monitoring frequency. Obviously, if you know there's a problem, let's make sure it's not going vertical. And so you, you increase the monitoring frequency to trend this uh, more often to make sure that you're, you can stop something before it goes catastrophic. Uh, know your rotor design, open versus closed. In this picture you saw it was an open bar design. So as the laminations start to burn off the tips and that opening gets larger, the fear of that bar coming out of that slot and slamming into the stator winding possibly doubles or triples the repair costs. So knowing if it's a closed or open bar design, because if this rotor was closed bar, 
even if you have a broken bar, it's not coming out of the slot, right? And then finally, rotor speed. This is a relatively slow motor, so the, 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 the centrifugal forces that might actually push that bar out are much less, which lowers the risk. So being able to, to take these things into account help you to at least um, understand the severity and, and maybe take some actions to prolong the life of the, of the defective rotor. And to put some numbers to uh, the, this specific asset, the cost, had it failed prematurely or doing a, during a production run, would have been in excess of 750,000 US dollars to 1.1 million US dollars. And that's significant regardless of what plant you're at. That's a lot of money. Oh yeah, that kind of money gets heads turning. It, it, uh, it certainly warrants some hard decisions to be made. And I think in this situation, they were able to, 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 to you know, to save production at the risk of, of, of making the problem a little worse. Right. Well, we would like to thank you for your time. As always, we appreciate uh, you watching or viewing our video presentations. If you have a video case study or a case study that you would like to present to us, please feel free to give us a call or view our website at www.pdma.com or call us at 813-621-6463. There, if you come to our website, you'll see a, a tremendous amount of information from additional case studies to our Tips of the Week archives. So I encourage you to, when you get a chance, to come take a look at us. Once again, thank you, Noah. Thank you, Todd. And uh, we look forward to seeing you real soon.